Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back into another episode of Speedway Soccer. I am Ben Wright, joined tonight by Jonathan Slape and Chris Ivey. Guys, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. Doing good, Ben. So we're going to we're gonna do a, a little bit of a different episode tonight. It's just going to be a quick hitter preview into the Nashville SC New York City FC game on Saturday. Nashville kicking off the 2023 MLS season at Geodis Park on national TV um, and Apple TV as well. But it's going to be on Fox. Um, it should be an, a fun game against a New York City team that they've they've had a, a little bit of a heated rivalry against, mostly going back to that game at, at Nissan Stadium when Dax McCarty and, and Maxi Morales were both sent off in the first half. Um, since then, it, there hasn't been much between them, um, but it, 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 it's a, a, a bit of a high-profile matchup to start the season, um, and the eyes of the league will be on Nashville for a little bit at least. So it, it should be a fun game. Um, Chris, I'll toss it to you first, just initially – What's your overall bird's eye view of New York City FC as they head into Nashville? That's a really good question and a loaded one at that. <laughs> um, New York City is, I think, kind of still a work in progress. So we've seen that it looks like Santi Rodriguez is going to re-sign with them, but I have my doubts that we see much of him on Saturday. Um, certainly won't be starting, it, and I would be shocked if he did. Um, and then just... In typical NYCFC fashion, and they're kind of late to the game in terms of adding pieces to the roster. Now they can get away with that, given their connections throughout the world and being able to take from other CFG teams. But good news for Nashville is that they draw them in the first match, and while they're still a work in progress. So we'll kind of, you know, remains to be seen what we get from NYCFC, but it's good on Nashville for getting them that in the first match on Saturday. Yeah. To kind of tie it back to our preseason um, preview. Uh, and I think I have NYCFC finishing the, uh, the year in 12th spot, but they're very much in a, a position right now coming into this where there's a lot of unknowns. Like we don't know what this roster is going to look like. I mean, it's not the first time that this has happened. I mean, I think, you know, last year there was some, you know, depth questions and then they bring in, um, you know, a few players. Uh, they brought in Tiago from uh, CFG, their uh, J league team. And I mean, we could very much see that again, but I think that Nashville is definitely coming into this um, at a good, like this is probably the best time to play NYCFC. Yeah. I mean, I they obviously lost um, Tanti Castellanos kind of midseason last year. And I mean, he has been up there with, with Hani Mokhtar over the last three years for just one of the, the best attackers in MLS. I mean, they Mokhtar and him were neck and neck for goals, for expected goals, for shots. The, the two of them were kind of in a, in a class of their own. Uh, they lost him. They never really replaced him. I think Talis Magno started out as a winger and it, it seems like they're going to try to fit him in at striker, which is, to be fair, I mean, it's it's what they did with Castellanos initially. He came in as a winger, shifted more centrally, and, and it worked out. Um, I, I, the big news for them is that um, Santi Rodriguez is back, um, and he he looks like the, the heir apparent to Maxi Morales, who was their their main playmaker for the last several years. Um, I I think getting him back, he he was a high end creator for them last year, and a, and a really good player. He's still really young. Um, getting him back is huge, but just overall. They don't have a ton of depth. They have a question mark at a lot of places. I mean, losing Sean Johnson, you replace him with Matt Freeze, who's a, who's a solid backup. And I mean, there, there's going to be drop offs there. You lost Alex Collins, just Anton Tinnerholm. Uh, they lost a ton of big players, and they haven't replaced them yet. Yeah, it just seems like a, a team that's in rebuild mode, but they haven't actually built much yet, and. It's just a really interesting offseason. I, I mean, we talked in our in our Nashville preview about kind of frustrations with not making more moves in the winter window, and I think you can just take that and multiply it exponentially for for New York City because it from the outside and based on this past winter window, I think there are a lot of question marks about what their long term plan is for the club, and not many answers. Yeah, it's almost like if Nashville lost. Um... Hani Mukhtar last summer, then followed up by losing Randall Leal, Walker Zimmerman, and uh, Joe Willis to a lesser extent. Um, because I think that uh, 
I think that Sean John's one of the best goalkeepers in the league and then not replacing them with anyone. And I think more importantly than just losing the talent, I think they lost a lot of leadership on this team because, I mean, Collins, uh, Sean John, you know, they were big personalities on the team. Uh, you know, were really some of the leaders. Luckily, I mean, Saint- Mor- Morales, Tinnerholm, Collins, and yeah. Johnson all are, were all captains. At, like and, they all wore the armband at one point or another. Yeah, and, and and to lose all of those players, like I think the loss of leadership is going to be felt even more than the loss of talent. Yeah, I mean it. There's just. It's almost hard to preview them because it's so hard to just even look at their roster and and think what like what their identity is going to be, where their starting eleven is. I mean, they they've had a fairly consistent style of play over the last couple of years, um, so I don't think there are going to be any surprises to how they try to approach the game. But fitting fitting what pieces they have into that is going to be a little bit tricky. Chris, if if you kind of had to had to pick like a front line that you expect to see against Nashville. Could you even come up with one that, that realistically makes sense? Um, without relying on other people, probably not just because you don't know. Um, you really, they've been disjointed in preseason. I think no matter what, we'll see Talos Magno up top, but as we kind of touched on, I, I don't know if that really scares you or anything. He's a really talented player, but he's yet to show it in that striker position and going back kind of to the leadership part of it too. I mean, I think we're all forgetting too, that Brian Christian's still a relatively new coach for this team. And when he took over the role last year, they proceeded to go on like a 10 game run of really, really bad form. Now they kind of righted the ship towards the end of the year, but I, to me, that was kind of a preview of what's to come and, and exacerbated by all of these losses and all the question marks that we still have, you know, entering the season and with first match on Saturday. Yeah, I think Talis Magno is, like you said, he's a really talented player. I have yet to see him being like the guy for a team. He seemed like a really good complimentary piece. Um, you you saw him work really well with Castellanos at times. I mean, he and he and uh, Maxi Morales had a really good understanding, but with all of those players gone, I mean, there's a lot, a lot riding on him. Who's st- he's still a young player, relatively unproven. Um, so yeah, I think he he's the danger man for them right now. Um, but it there, it's still yet to be seen if if he can kind of carry the team in, in a way that other players have had to in the past. Yeah, I mean, but he's he is only twenty, and you know, for a guy that's kind of played all over the front line, eleven goals, eight eight assists, and all comps last season. Sure, um, you know, he's not fall. I don't feel he's far from making that jump. And like, no, I, this, I agree. And this may be the this may be the year that he takes that step forward. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I think a lot of this, I, I'm still almost thinking of them without Santi Rodriguez. Because it was it was so up in the air if he was even coming back, I think getting him back is huge. But I I just do think it is a lot to ask for a twenty year old to go from being kind of, uh, like a second a second option or a complimentary piece to being okay now, scoring goals is is down to you. Um, I think he's he has the talent to do it, and I think this is a, a huge season for him. Um, Slave, I'll, I'll keep it with you. Just initially, how do you think Nashville from from what we know of them from I mean, we haven't seen any preseason from, but just from what what we knew of how they've played so far, how do you think they match up with with NYCFC? I mean, I think that for all of the, I mean, even just how they line up, I think for all of you know the uncertainty around um, NYCFC, there is a lot of certainty um, for Nashville. Uh, we know that New York City FC like does like to try to possess the ball. Um, I mean, they're not like you know from a sterile possession. I think Nashville while they are at home are going to look to play on the break and look to exploit some of those gaps, especially in areas um, where there is maybe some people working on, um, you know, Chano and Tiago, uh, you know, they don't have a lot, a lot of time together at the back, um, you know, trying to exploit some of those gaps on the, uh, at, in between the fullback and the center back there. And I think that um, they're, they're that's what they're going to be looking to do against uh, NYCFC. Chris, do you have any any thoughts on how they'll approach this one? 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of see it in a similar way, especially with NYCFC wanting to possess the ball and push forward. Nashville's going to be just happy to allow them to do so, especially those fullbacks as they creep up further and further. One of the big things that we've seen with Nashville this offseason is that they are kind of from what it looks like, going to line up in more of a, a 4 4 2 with two more traditional wingers that both bring speed elements to the game. So if those fullbacks for NYCFC start creeping up, it plays into right right into what Nashville did this offseason by going to get Fafa Pico. And if we see Randall Leal on the right, or even if Schaffelberg's in there, it's going to create acres of space for those guys to run in on. So I, I think not even just. We, we talk about this being a good matchup for Nashville, given the flux of NYCFC's roster, but just from a tactical standpoint as well, I think it plays right into Nashville's hands. For either, either one of you, whoever wants to take this first, with Mukhtar having not played for the last several preseason games, he, he uh, felt some hamstring tightness in the warm-up to, I think it was their game, um, I'm blanking Philly. on which game. Yeah, Philadelphia. You're right. Felt hamstring tightness. They kept him out as a precaution. Sounded like it was a short-term thing, and then he hasn't. He didn't play in, in the next two games. Um, Gary Smith says he's he's going to be a push for um, for Saturday's game. Do you think Nashville can survive and and get three points against NYCFC without him? I think they can. Um, just because they're playing it, they're playing a team that is just in a state of flux. So I still think they can get uh, those three points and, and get a result. I think though that the the difference between the two is Pani Mutar starts. I think you know it's, it's just a shame because I feel like it it sets the season off really well um, because I think that could be a very entertaining game. Um, we have seen a lot of instances. Um, well, not a lot of instances. There has Hani has not missed a ton of games, and we've seen Nashville be able to get results in those instances. Um, but it is not pretty. Um, you know, th- they uh, can be scrappy. Um, you know, late goals relying on on set pieces. Uh, so it's definitely possible. For, from a narrative standpoint, I think it's really compelling for all the talk in the off season about. Mm-hmm where does the secondary scoring come from and who is there to provide a lift next to Hani? Well, if he's not there in that first match, you're, you're put under the fire in that first match. Did you guys do enough in the off season to address those concerns, both with new acquisitions and with whatever and whomever starts at the number nine position, whether it's CJ Sapond or, or Till Bunbury. So if you don't have Hani Mutar, somebody's got to step up and this is test number one for them. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a. I mean, I think this is a big season for Randall Ayal, um, because I mean he he missed so much of last year injured, and, and I don't think he ever really got into form after after he came back from injury. His numbers dropped off from um, from twenty twenty one. I think we've all looked at this team and thought he was going to be like kind of the guy behind Hani Mukhtar, and he just hasn't turned into that so far. But if Mukhtar doesn't play, I, I think he's kind of the clear favorite to fill in for him in that kind of second striker role. Um, and, and regardless of if Mukhtar plays or not, I mean, there is a clear need for secondary scoring. They haven't really addressed it from the forward position. And I, I think it it's going to be interesting to watch if he kind of steps up and, and takes on a bigger role. Um, because, I mean, he, he's still a young player. He's clearly talented. Um, but I think they're, I think they're, he hasn't really hit his ceiling yet. I think there's still more that he can bring to Nashville. Um, and I, I think potentially filling in for Hani Mukhtar, um, literally playing the role that he plays is a good place to start. Um, uh, let's just, let's just wrap it up here with predictions for the game. Uh, Slate, do you have a, do you have a, maybe not even a score line, but do you think Nashville gets a win or, or what do you think happens? I do think Nashville gets a win. I th- and I, I'll say the one other thing that I was going to say about Randall yeah, go for it. is I think that last season, um, the national team situation uh, did not help. Um, the, the, the coach there um, Suarez made some really weird decisions and, and decided to go back with the old guard left left lay all and, and a couple of key young players off that roster. And I think some of the uh, instability, of the national team looking forward to a world cup definitely 
um, unsettled him in a way uh, that I think that he's uh, he's he's going to be you know backfiring. And I, I like I said, I do think Nashville gets a win on uh, on Sun or Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I think if Hani plays, I'm going to go a 3-0 type of win, pretty dominating fashion. If he's not there, I think it's a scrappy one nothing type of victory for Nashville. Um, one one other question that we we haven't planned for, but just how how big of a factor do you think being back in the Eastern Conference and having kind of a more normal home road split is going to be is going to have for for Nashville? I mean, because obviously. I think we, at the end of the season last year, we almost got tired of using the road trip as an excuse. And I think there was some validity to that because they set themselves up really well on the road trip and then kind of never lived up to that at home. But now, now that you're starting your, your first game of the season, the season, excuse me, in your own stadium, you have less travel. How big of a factor do you think that's going to be for them? I think it'll be a decent factor for them. Um, Certainly less travel, less time zone shifts, which I think is just as hard as much as, you know, the pure miles traveled of going to try to play those, you know, games on Pacific Coast time. Um, And some familiarity, too. Um, It's hard going into a season where you just have a one-off trip to the Western Conference with a lot of opponents you may have never seen or just one time in your previous history. So I think it it will be a good return back to the East whether it makes a, you know a several point difference, I, I can't say that, but I, I think it certainly will help. I I I think the conference change does help to an extent, but I think what is more important is the split between the home and the the away. I mean, I even think to an extent of like fans being able to impact results and and just the atmosphere, Geotis, because. Um, I, I can't even imagine Chris for you as you know someone that drives in from from Knoxville for games like you know there would be some of those times where it's like within two weeks you play four games at home um, or even like three games within like a ten day period and it just uh, it gets drink I mean it it, just, it doesn't have as good of an atmosphere there's not that same excitement about being home I think for the players too just because it's like all all the time and I just think that that kind of staggering and like a more normal schedule and the fact there's not a world cup too. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. And I think also just having actual like local rivals because I, the fact that they played their first season at Geodis park and never got to play a team like Cincinnati. Yep. I mean, I, I don't, I think that that's a big deal. I mean, they, they didn't have any of those built in rivalries and I think it's hard to, to kind of keep growing those when it's so stop start. So now that you're back in the East, you get to play Atlanta regularly, Cincinnati, Charlotte. I think that's going to be huge for not just Nashville, but kind of like the, the regional fan base and kind of starting to develop more like traditions and rivalries. And I think it, it just kind of helps everybody. Um, One last thing here before we get out thoughts on the, on the new kid. Slate, I'll toss it to you because I know you always have kid takes. Um, I don't I it's just it's a black shirt. I, I think my biggest thing is I, I would have liked a little more um you know, texturing some sublimination to kind of in the pattern. Um so that's that's kind of my thing is I feel like it may be in theory, but I feel like it just didn't go far enough. And I say that as someone who wears a lot of black um, and, and likes black kids. I just, I still just felt a bit underwhelmed um, with it. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I'm kind of with you there, Slape. I think texture would have helped. I think a lot of us are just kind of burned from the last few years of MLS where we were kind of stuck with a lot of just black and white kits across the league. Now to Adidas credit, this crop of kits released this year has been stellar. The best that at least I can remember. Um, But, you know, good nine out of 10 concept execution, a little lower than that. Um, But at, at least they're trying, you know, something different than just, oh, here's what the Adidas design team created some random pattern based off who knows what that they try to tie it to the city. So I at least liked that there's elements that they are trying to base kits off of instead of just sticking with random geometric patterns. Yeah, I agree. I, I think 
it replaces that away kit that for me was one of my favorites just because it was different and it had kind of that underlying pattern. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a bummer. Um, I, I really like the idea. Um, I love all black anyway. Um, but I, I think in, in a weird way, it almost does stand out because it is so simple. And I think most of the other teams in the league took big, I mean, a lot of them took big swings as well, but it, I think Nashville almost stands out for how simple it is. I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's fine. I think it'll look good on the field. It'll photograph a lot better than the than the home kit. Um, but yeah, it's nice to see them try something different at least. Um, and, and I agree. I think overall this crop of kits has been just way more interesting. It's not like the same kind of cookie cutter type stuff. I think yeah, it's taken a lot of big swings, and some of them have paid off really well. Yeah, some of them paid off. I mean, I mean those that that probably know me know that I I love talking about jersey design jerseys and and things like that but even some of the ones in this year that i don't like or i maybe think they are hideous i at least appreciate the fact that you know by and large i think teams have taken risk and i think we've seen like Phillies started getting the fan groups involved and that's what brought gave us that um electric kit the lightning bolt kit that mm-hmm. they did um and so, like, I just think, you know, more creativity. Um, there's a lot of also underlying things with, like, how jerseys are manufactured these days that makes it easier uh, for teams to take more risks. But uh, I won't I won't give a dissertation uh, on that. <laughs> well, no, let's just go for it. I'm going to put uh, you on the spot. We haven't talked about this. What What's your favorite? What's your favorite of the MLS kits that came out? Ooh, favorite of the MLS kits. Um I really, really love the Minnesota one. Man, that's um, what I was going to go with. It <laughs> is. Um, I mean, Minnesota has had some of the best kits in soccer since even when they were back when they were in NASL. Um, that wing kit, I felt that the wing kit that they tried to do in MLS was kind of a half measure. Um, but, yeah, the Minnesota jerseys this year are really, really good. And I, I also like – I know they're not like a – like related and associated, but like there is the, uh, the Minnesota Aurora, Aurora mm-hmm. FC up there, the women's team um, that has some similar branding, uh, which I kind of just, I like a region to have, you know, if you're going to have multiple teams, like having some kind of like cohesive identity that probably wasn't planned. Uh, but yeah, I love the Minnesota Jersey. I'll throw out the Portland as one as <laughs> one that I liked. That's it, what I was going with after Slape stole my first option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, at least we're all in the same mind there, but I mean, the plaid fits Portland. It, it just fits the market. I don't think anybody else could really pull that off. Like they did. It certainly wouldn't work in, you know, Nashville to do a plaid kit like it would for Portland. So I thought the, they nailed something that worked with their Jersey worked with their market. And it, it was a really good kit. Yeah, I, I think if I'm down to my third choice now, I'd probably go with Charlotte, which I know hasn't been like getting as much hype. I like the Charlotte did, one. It's pretty simple. It's but it's a completely different color scheme than than we've seen from pretty much anyone in MLS. I mean, I know there's purple, which kind of relates to Orlando, but the way they've done it is really different. And I think it's just a cool look because they took a swing that's completely out of their normal color away. And I think it just works. And I, I like the, uh, the crowns that are in the sublimation yeah. as well, yeah, which I think are, are a really nice touch there. My least favorite is Austin, because I think they took what was a really good, what was a really good look and just kind of ruined it. Well, I mean, they're doing the exact same thing that Atlanta did. Yep. Atlanta had that red and black stripe kit, uh, and then decided to mess with it. And which Atlanta coincidentally is by- one of my favorites this year. Not because they did anything crazy, but just because they got back to basics and it works. Yeah. The real loser in all of this, though, is DC. For as many oh, man. years as supporters have cried out for a cherry blossom kit, yes, they finally did it. It just didn't pull off as well as a lot of the concept designs. Well, I had and, seen. and you know, it's bad when they use lighting in the promo shoots to make it look pink because they, they, they should have just done that. To, to I mean, start with. they're doing exactly. I mean, it's like when Miami came into the league and like, Oh, we got this pink team. And then they were, wore the, like for that first season, like the lightest, most pale shade of pink. Yep. Because I was like, if you're going to wear pink, make it pink. Just go for it. Go all out. I, yeah. I don't get the hype around the Red Bulls either. 
I don't know. I feel like I've seen a lot of people putting it in their top three, and it's just I don't know. It doesn't it's, do much for me. It's different. They brought in a design, like a fashion designer, um, who has like a lot of hype around like his collections and stuff, and I think that's where some of it is uh, coming in. And I will say, um, not MLS kits, but something new that's come out this recently, the Jamaica jerseys mm. um, that Adidas just put out. Um, they same similar thing brought in a fashion designer, Wales Bonner. Um, incredible jerseys yeah i mean i think i probably would like it more if it was a secondary but they just complete like completely changing like your what was a pretty pretty iconic home look it just feels a little bit strange but it's At a least... kid for gen z we're millennials that's the problem i can see it's... what they're doing there <sighs> we're all but... old i guess it's lumping Ben in with the olds it seems. I, mean, I have odd. four. I have four kids, so I'm. Yeah, I have, true. I've, He's the youngest. Yet, I've the aged out of the oldest. Oldest. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right, we should probably yeah. wrap up this because Loop and Davey will kill us if they hear us talking about kids <laughs> for this long. Um, guys, anything else you want to plug before we get out of here, Chris? Do you have you have anything coming up on on Broadway Sports Media that you want to toss out? Um, I think we've just got some other just kind of preseason stuff um, headed out on Broadway sports as we get ready for Saturday's opener. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I, I mean, I have preview coming Friday. I'm going to try to also get a Jersey piece out um, as well. Uh, you know, kind of breaking down, ranking some of the jerseys, um, telling you why the things that you love suck and why the things you hate are better. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, we'll have preview content out of Broadway Sports Media. Um, Chris and I have been, Chris has been cranking out some um, positional previews of Nashville SC. Um, we'll have our full preseason predictions out as well. Um, I'll have a preview coming out at American Soccer Analysis, kind of trying to look at some Nashville SC stats. Um, and we'll also be trying to get more into the swing of things with this podcast and actually keep it a regular thing, which is the third or fourth time that we've promised that. Um, so may maybe this time it'll stick. Um, but for now, thank thanks for uh, tuning in and listening to us. Um, I'm Ben Wright joined by Jonathan Slate, Chris Ivy. You can check out all our work at broadwaysportsmedia.com. And if you're not already, um, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Speedway Sock. Um, we'll be back next week with more. Thanks. Never go full shepherd. Nope.